In 2014, Clayton Lockett was to be executed in a particularly grisly way. The method was to be lethal injection, which I think for most people who haven't studied the death penalty, would consider that the most humane way to execute someone. But it's not. And it's somewhat surprising how bad America is at killing people, given how much we do it. Lockett's death took 45 minutes. Throughout, it was unclear how conscious he was. Oklahoma's prison system had been scrambling to get drugs for the execution, which have become harder and harder to come by. Pharmaceutical companies aren't too keen to be known as the vendor of death drugs, particularly when many of them are in countries that have already abolished the death penalty. This fiasco culminated in Lockett being conscious, mostly, during his execution, and clearly in a lot of pain. The Atlantic describes the Kafka-esque moment when Lockett becomes aware of what's going on. The warden asked whether it would be possible to resuscitate Lockett. Zellmer said he could start CPR, but that in order to save him, they'd have to take him to an emergency room. This further confused the paramedic. He's dying, she thought. Isn't that why we're here? The execution was completely botched, as many recently have been, and it raises the question of why we continue this practice. What draws a society to abolition, and what draws it to kill? To understand why the state contorts itself to kill someone in a way that is supposedly humane, we need to look at the history of the death penalty. The death penalty has been around at least as long as laws have. The Code of Hammurabi requires execution for a variety of different penalties. From the philosopher Socrates, to the Jewish dissident Jesus Christ, to the many wives of Henry VIII, execution has been a convenient way to eliminate opponents or undesirable elements from society. A public execution can function as both entertainment and a method of maintaining social order. Given the convenience and utility of the death penalty for a violent state, I was surprised to learn that its abolition happened in some places, at least for a time, much sooner than I would have thought. William the Conqueror in the 11th century abolished the death penalty. Now, he still tortured people, but the current day United States also executes and tortures people. So, you know, stones, glass houses. But what did William the Conqueror in the 1000s believe or feel that most Americans now don't? This is a wide enough topic that I'm going to limit this discussion to the American history of executions, where the practice has remained pervasive, unlike most other developed democracies. Since 1608 in Jamestown, colonists exported their harsh justice system and executed prisoners by hanging, then by firing squad, then we moved to electric chair, briefly used the gas chamber, and now we are at lethal injection. You can see how these methods tend to get less gruesome as time goes on. At least less gruesome for the audience. Which is ironic because killing someone is always going to be at least a somewhat gruesome affair. At the end of the day, there's only so much you can do. But you see this pattern. Hanging is ghastly, and so it's done away with in favor of the more humane and cheaper electric chair. But that turns out to be incredibly gross and ghastly and is often botched in practice. So then lethal gas has a brief popularity, but that is also complicated and not easy to carry out. Now finally, you have lethal injection, the current standard since 1976. The Chapman Protocol used in lethal injections, the latest humane death penalty development, includes three steps. First, injecting a short-acting barbiturate which anesthetizes the victim, hopefully in under 30 seconds. Second, injecting a paralytic that keeps the victim from moving. Third, injecting potassium chloride, which will stop the heart. But wait a second. What is that second step doing? It seems a bit out of place. To anti-death penalty advocates, the fact that these drugs are used in executions is revealing. If the sedative worked, why would you need to paralyze someone? They argue that the paralytic prevents us from seeing the offender's distress, so that the procedure appears clinical and painless. 
even if it's not. The paralytic used in lethal injection is for the comfort of the audience, not the condemned. It gives the illusion of a humane execution, which is a complete oxymoron. The United States has proved conclusively over the last 200 odd years that you cannot kill someone nonviolently. It's in this contradiction that the American character is found. To both want a permanent, punitive, and destructive justice, and also want that justice doled out in a way that does not make us feel bad or responsible. So that is how we kill, currently. And most Americans still favor the death penalty, 60% supporting to 39% opposed. But why do we kill? To listen to death penalty advocates, there's a few arguments, and we're going to run through them. Deterrence, justice or closure to victims, and the removal of the criminal from the world and society. Proponents usually try to prove deterrence with statistical models, but the support is murky at best. You can massage the numbers and find a slight correlation, but the sample size is so small and there's so many other factors that contribute to crime that it is just impossible to know for sure. Another YouTuber, Sean, does a better job than I can arguing against this point, and his video is linked below if you want to explore more. But I want to focus on how the idea that the death penalty leads to deterrence of other violent crimes is based in a fundamental misunderstanding of how crime happens particularly murder. The large majority of homicides are spontaneous. They are not premeditated at all. And only around 1 in 300 murders is punished with the death penalty, so the idea that a calculating criminal is weighing their options, realizes they live in a death penalty jurisdiction, and decides not to do the crime they were thinking about doing? It seems far-fetched to me. The second argument is more of an emotional one, and I think it's one that gets closer to the heart of the matter. This is the idea that the death penalty can provide closure for victims' families. This may be true for some people, but I want to complicate the issue a little bit. A distant relative of mine was a prison guard. He was killed by an inmate, and that inmate was then given the death penalty. But a death sentence means that the justice process drags on and on. 22 years pass between when he committed the crime and the actual execution, which was postponed four times. That is picking at the festering wound of grief. That is not closure. And some members of my family petitioned the governor to commute the death sentence. But the governor ignored those requests. When you're talking about killing someone for the sake of victims' family members, you should keep in mind that a victim's family aren't a monolithic group. They likely have very different ideas about what they consider justice and what they want to happen to the perpetrator. But as it stands, victims' families are listened to when they ask for death, but not when they ask for life. They are used to bolster what the state already wanted to do, and if they object, they're ignored. This hits at something crucial. The questions of whether someone deserves to die and whether the state should be allowed to kill people are entirely separate. As death penalty critic Brian Stevenson puts it, the question is not whether someone deserves to die, it's whether we deserve to kill. Something you also hear is that the death penalty is necessary to completely remove heinous criminals from society. The issue here is determining which crimes constitute the worst of the worst. Who is eligible for this final removal? Who is no longer deserving of being in society? Ideally, this would be based on an unbiased moral accounting of the crime. Instead, it can be based on a variety of factors. A 2001 report from the University of North Carolina found that the odds of getting a death sentence increased 3.5 times if the victim was white rather than black. And this is consistent with findings in other states. A second factor is whether judges in that area are elected. According to a study by Reuters in 2015, judges are much more likely, 26% versus 11%, to reverse death sentences in states where judges aren't elected. 
because judges don't want to seem soft on crime to a vengeful public that they will need to face at the ballot box. Finally, the most salient issue of all is where the crime was committed. About a third of all executions since 1976 have been in Texas. Where you are is much more salient than what you did when it comes to saving your life from the violent state. So while we would like to view this justice system as capable of objectively separating the worst of the worst, it's instead a blunt instrument that kills based on racism, politics, and convenience. Having argued against three hypotheses about why we kill, I want to lay out another possible answer. We are a violent society. And we kill because we want to. We are a vengeful, angry people that throws convicts in a perverse lottery to be sacrificed to our violent whims. And we try to dress it up in legal processes in a thin veil of justice. We try to make it humane, but these are illusions. It's an attempt to separate our killing, our systematic, premeditated killing, from the killing that madmen do. Capital punishment is the most premeditated of murders, to which no criminal's deed, however calculated, can be compared. For there to be an equivalency, the death penalty would have to punish a criminal who had warned his victim of the date on which he would inflict a horrible death on him, and who, from that moment onward, had confined him at his mercy for months. Such a monster is not to be encountered in private life.